I'm delighted to say a few words of welcome to our keynote speaker, Will Hutton. Um, alongside a hugely influential career as a writer and political economist, uh, Will holds a remarkable range of prominent roles. Uh, he is currently Principal of Hafler College at Oxford and he chairs the Big Innovation Centre. And he's also a director of the Scott Trust and non-executive director of the Satellite Applications Catapult, amongst many other things. Um, so I'm very pleased that he's agreed to come and talk to us today. Um, some of you may not know this, but Will's links with Wizard go back a very long way. His first degree was in economics and sociology at Bristol University, where his personal tutor was Hugh Bennion. And uh, I'm not sure which one influenced the other most, <laughs> but uh, perhaps we can claim some influence over his career. It's certainly true that Will has produced a remarkable body of critical work, including uh, The State We Are In, which was a forensic and influential critique of the condition of uh, British society. And uh, as we'll hear, I'm sure, more recently, his book, How Good Can We Be? And here he addresses the current broken political and economic order. And let's not underestimate the failure of our existing institutions in this respect. And he sets out a series of very thoughtful uh, ideas and practical solutions, I think, offering alternative routes to uh, good society. And these ideas have enormous relevance to the research that we are all doing here at Wizard. So it's therefore with great pleasure I introduce Will Hutton. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm, uh, I'm rather amazed that on uh, day three of this um, event, A, so many of you are still here, uh, and B, that you've come along to hear me say a few words. I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, I, I, uh, put together a kind of short kind of presentation, some slides up here, some of them I'll whiz through very quickly. Um, but just so you know what's going to happen, um, I'd like to kick off by saying a few words which I've... Uh, I did a, a talk at, um, um, in Oxford on, on Saturday afternoon and uh, actually two of the people who were there, David Markham and Judith, uh, so everyone got so excited about this idea of general purpose technologies and I thought I'd better tell people more about them. So I'm going to kick off kind of discussing <coughs> the kind of pace of accelerative change I think is happening over the decades ahead. And then I want to answer the question of how you deal with it. I'm going to ask if our capitalism is fit for purpose and that will segue into some of the discussion of both the state we're in and, the, and, the, and our recent book and how good we can be. And I want to try and finish <coughs> off with a kind of sense of what kind of manifesto for reform might be in both um, the operation of British capitalism and the operation of British society. And it's a far cry, of course, from, your, from our public agenda in which actually um, the answers to the exam question of how to create a good economy and society is a public expenditure of 30% of GDP and the public debt to GDP ratio that's falling is how George Osborne um, would answer that question. <coughs> but as he's... Um, almost the only serious man or woman left standing either side um, of the political gangway in the House of Commons. Um, we have to take this agenda pretty seriously. And I'm going to try and outline what I think could be done in Wales um, uh, by both policymakers and actually by the social science community. So that's what I'm going to try and do in 40 minutes. <laughs> actually, I'm going to fail, aren't I? But anyway... Um, but let's, get, let's, let, let's kick off with a... With a mm -hmm. And by the way, the big innovation center, some of these slides I made up on the train coming down, some I worked on last night, some I just plagiarized from some of our big innovation center presentations. I chair the big innovation center, which is an open innovation hub in, uh, in, um, in, in London, which is, tries to promote some of this stuff, actually. So let's go. Um, general post technologies. Um, Actually, I was asked to, to talk to one of the um, leadership candidates, the Labour Party, yesterday. And uh, one of the first things that was said was, you know, she gave an account, and I'm not showing you her gender, um, so you can only want two, um, of a, um, an exchange that she had in Yorkshire, and that probably narrows the field even more. Uh, um, 
uh, in which a number of constituent, a number of her constituents came up to her and said, "Look, you know, what about the jobs of tomorrow? Where are they going to come from? What are you doing about it? Do you understand what's going on?" And, and she felt that her reply that they was going to cut the business rate for small businesses was less than adequate. Um, and so I launched into this, and I think this is, um, and I, I do think that some comprehension of this um, and, of, and this agenda should be in the back of everybody's minds, whether a policymaker, a business person, a social scientist. General post knowledge has changed the world. Um, you can run your eye down that list. You can see it goes back to 9000 BC. A general post technology is a technology which um, contains within its own DNA the capacity to be very much more than when it first began, so that you know, the, the railway you know, the first railway that went from Stockton to Darlington is recognisably the same stuff that takes you um, a kind of, uh, kind of advanced passenger train today. But, uh, so 200 years, that substantially changed, but it's conceptually doing exactly the same thing. And it may originate in a particular sector like transport, but it has massive spillover effects on the rest of the, on the, rest of the economy and society. And um, uh, if you, I can go into this in a bit more. I want to go through best part of 28 or 29 slides, so each slide is only about 30 seconds. So I've already spent more time than I dare on this. Um, but uh, whether it be the three-masted sailing ship or the locomotive or the internet, um, one substantive point, if you're an economist, or, or is that actually none of these GPTs have managed to get going without some kind of codependency between public and private. So that it was Ferdinand Isabella who paid for the kind of um, clever, clever kind of shipwrights um, in those dockyards um, in Seville and Cadiz that was able to build a hull strong enough to take a third mast of a sailing ship, which of course meant it could sail close to the wind, circumnavigate the globe, open up America, create the great European inflation of the um, 16th century and all the consequences thereof. But it was a codependency between public and private. It was Protestant princes um, that placed the big orders for the printing press because they wanted the Bible printed in, uh, in German and not in Latin. Um, the internet was created by the Department of Defense. You won't find one of these transformative in innovations that actually changed the world without public agency of some sort, uh, some collectivization of risk, um, some taking the burden of it, some socialization of it, actually. Um, very, very important. Um, uh, the business secretary, Mr. Javid, uh, has got uh, when he, his belief in entrepreneurialism and Thatcherism and all the rest of it, and distrust of industrial policy, I want to call it an industrial approach. Um, this kind of language or this kind of discourse would be completely foreign to him. He would live in a world in which it's all done by Nietzsche and supermen and women having light bulb moments and driving through innovation, taking all the risk themselves. Not true. Here are some of the ones that are coming up um, in, the, in the decades ahead because what you need to know is if there were nine of these GPTs in the 20th century, there'll be 20 of them in the 21st century. In other words, there'll be more um, change, the economic base, um, in the next 100 years than the previous 500. Um, and actually, uh, digitization is already a kind of doing the same thing. It's kind of, there are some GPTs that are more powerful than others. I mean, I think. You know, the wheel is a pretty bloody good one. Um, electricity is another one. But I think digitization is a kind of meta GPT, which is actually having huge impact already, uh, incalculable consequences on kind of everything from medicine through to transport, um, you know, journalism through to academia. Um, uh, there's really no walk of life that's not going to be affected by it. Um, I can again dwell on that. Um, Longer, but the, I want to get through the whole thing so you get a to, a totali the, the, the totality of the pictures I see it. Um, this has created, already beginning to create, a um, kind of dramatic changes in investment patterns. Um, intangible investment is investment in essentially ideas, brands, copyrights, patents, R&D, of one form or another, um, business model kind of patenting. Um, and uh, algorithms, uh, computer programs, everything that sits, you know, all the intelligence that sits behind, you know, what sits in your mobile phone, that's intangible investment. Now, actually, the crossover point was 2000, where intangible investment in Britain exceeded tangible investment, and now it's running at nearly twice the rate. 
um, tangible investment in, in plant machinery, stuff that goes down mines. We used to go down mines in the valleys here. Uh, all that's, uh, and you can see that uh, on current trends, um, intangible investment will be the story. The stock of intangibles is very much higher than tangibles. Again, when I said this to this term, the leadership candidate yesterday, it was really quite a surprise to her. And it, I imagine it's not a, maybe a surprise to some of you. Um, what it means, of course, is that it has huge imp impact for human capital uh, and, and how you form it. It has huge impact, actually, for, how, for our society and you know, who talks to whom via what means. Um, and it's only just getting off the ground. Um, and, of course, if there's going to be uh, the number of GPTs, and you know, by the way, there are because of the crossovers between disciplines in, uh, in science. The science itself is growing exponentially. It's, uh, you know, all the scientists at my college in Oxford tell me how little they know. And my wife's been struggling with leukemia for the last 18 months, and I can tell you that they may know a lot about kind of what drives um, these cancers, but the kind of cocktail of chemotherapy, chemo drugs that um, they put in a, a body to kind of deal with the molecular stuff that the key, they've got no idea what's taking place. And we will have a better idea in 10 or 15 years' time. But uh, you know, what we don't know, um, as any scientist will tell you, uh, is very much uh, you know, can dwarfs what we do know. Um, this is just to give you a, just a sense of, of what I'm talking about. I'm talking about intangibles. Um, you, uh, you can run your eye down that. And we'll come back to that if, if you want to. Um, that's just a sense I, I wanted to give you some sense just in one sector, you know, what it's doing in transport. I think that, you know, the era of the driverless car, you know, means kind of, is just extraordinary. Um, that, um, but it's, 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 it's across, as I said, I mean, I, and I want to, I want to kind of put this on the table as an area for potential social science in, in, in Wales. I mean, just this, um, you know, are MOOCs that smart? Um, can we get clever about about transport? Why? I don't know whether you what happened to, whether you were around last Monday night, but I was in the train um, that actually uh, inver uh, you know, tragically got involved in two fatalities outside Paddington. Um, it sat there for three hours before it was moved. The trains behind were five hours. There must have been the best part of a quarter million people uh, on the network on Monday afternoon whose, <coughs> whose, whose lives were kind of utterly disrupted by a train not being intelligent enough to avoid um, people who were, should have been on the track. And then the lack of intelligence in the system, and we have to respond to that, was also incredible. So there's a whole kind of level up we're going we're, we're, we're to move in the next kind of 20 or 30 years, you know, transform, so, transform so many things. But of course, I mean, it creates a world of unknowns. I, anyway, and I was introduced as um, I'm on the board of the Satellite Applications Catapult in Harwell, and we're trying to figure out all the applications for um, what's going to happen um, in space as the cost of launching kind of um, satellites kind of becomes tiny and, then, and the amount of sensors you can put in them becomes huge. Um, you, know, you can do amazing, amazing things from space uh, already. I mean, I, I was showing the Earth observation thing. We can now track actually just exactly what ISIS are doing in some of these uh, um, ancient um, sites that have been um, despoiled in Syria. You can actually just you can see what's being moved from space and you can see the intensity of it and you can track where it's going too. Uh, you can see um, what forms of infrastructure are weakening, what might you can see where there might be kind of earthquakes. It's unbelievable. Um, but you're set, but and, uh, similarly, you know, I, you know, I can't tell you, uh, I'm one of the kind of 12 men and women who own the Guardian and the Observer, and we think it's all going to be distributed to you by, by a mobile, but we can't honestly tell you um, whether we can monetize that enough to support our current. You know, 700 journalists who work at the Observe and the Guardian. Um, we hope we can, um, but we, we doubt you'll be reading 2,000 word articles like the one this morning on Serco um, on your mobile device, uh, unless you've got m amazing eyes. Um, so uh, how are, and, and everybody is confronting um, the, uh, this kind of uh, secular increase in risk. Um, uh, no one running a business can be certain um, exactly kind of what structure it will have um, in the next 10 or 15 years. And of course, in this, the right, the political right are completely correct. Businesses have to have extreme agility. You can't, you can't actually offer tenured employment um, uh, uh, in this kind of environment. You just don't know kind of whether you'll be about in 10 years' time. Um, 
And of course, the business response to that, which is to displace risk onto ordinary workers, the growth of temporary work, agency work, zero out contracts, and all the rest of it, um, is a perfectly rational response from their point of view. But actually, society should understand that it is perfectly rational from their point of view, but wholly irrational, irrational from the point of view of the people onto whose shoulders this risk is being displaced. And we need much better institutions in, in, in civil society than we've got to deal with this risk displacement. Um, it also, I think, has big implications for the way you do business. Um, actually, the way that we think, the way that the political right and the cl classical economists think about doing business in the environment is, of course, 360 degrees wrong, because the, your, that's, all, that's all predicated in a world in which consumer preferences are more or less known um, and, can, and can be rationally ranked, and also where businesses kind of can have a, a reasonable sense of what the risk is out there which, of course, neither can do in this environment. Um, businesses are operating in an environment of complete unknown unknowns. Uh, no business I know thinks it has all the answers. It has to be much more porous, much more networked, much more open. And to be networked, open, and porous means that you have to, people have to trust you if they're going to give you the information and share the information with you. And this kind of question of how you share data um, it's not just an issue for kind of medical sociologists wondering about the privacy of health data and all the rest of it when you share it at the National Health Service. It's actually, it's actually a big issue for business. And, and you can only share data with people you trust. And you only trust people if they have a clear purpose to the business they're undertaking. If they're only about um, cheating, maximizing shareholder value, cutting a deal to get their profits up in the next three months to inflate the share price and thus the remuneration of the director's team, you might not trust them. The kind of capitalism that we're creating, uh, particularly in Britain and America, is not conducive to capturing uh, and the benefits of this revolution or navigating our ways through it. Um, so open innovation has been the kind of, the, the, the kind of um, response to this. People are opening up, opening up, opening up. I mean, it's not just, it's not just uh, gone from a you know, Procter & Gamble or Unilever kind of trying to do lots of joint ventures with small companies. It's actually now become, you know, let's think about our ecosystem and how we can actually open up completely to it. So that you'll see, for example, at Oxford, um, nine drugs companies have come together under the, under the uh, Human Genome Project, um, Structured Genome Project, I should call it, actually, in which uh, they pre-agreed to share the results of their research because there are 32,000 to the power of 31,999 kind of possibilities of actually um, gene construction and no non drug company can actually navigate your way through that. If you're going to, be, if you're going to come up with interventions, for example, that might help one of your partners in 20 years' time survive leukemia better than my partner is doing it, we're going to have to get much faster and smarter at the way we actually can share this information. And so they're having to do it together. And that is actually a big phenomena uh, and, it, you can, and you can see it happening across sector and sector. You can also see that actually the, 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 the high growth firms, you can see it in the, in the small uh, firm population, the SME population and large uh, population. Uh, innovative, and the firms that grow faster are the ones which have got more intellectual capital, intangible assets on their balance sheet. It's not surprising, but it's one of the findings of the big innovation center. You know, this is, when I, when I give this presentation, because I don't know, bullshit, you know, but actually it, you know, it's just the lived experience of everybody in the real world, and it goes more intense every three months. Um, but is our capitalism in Britain fit for purpose? Um, and I would say, absolutely not. You know, we we have a we we've developed this. The we developed our corporations, our top hundred, and certainly our top three hundred and fifty in the FTSE one hundred. Uh, I think the the PLC is an utterly broken model. I mean, the shareholders, um, global asset management groups, typically. Um, but also pension funds and insurance companies who are index tracking do not own these companies who are trying to navigate their way through this. Uh, I'm, I'm setting up a little consortium at the Big Innovation Centre called the, Purpose, the Purposeful Company Project. And one of the companies joining it, which is the lead top pharmaceutical company, was uh, the CEO was telling me about the pressure he's been under. He said, well, well, you know, we, you, you're Sir John Bell, emeritus professor of medicine at, at Oxford, is putting lots of pressure on me to spend money on R&D at Oxford. And, or your colleagues at universities around England and Wales, but actually I've got three shares on the phone in the last 24 hours want me to spend the billion pounds in my balance sheet on buying back my shares to keep the share price up and not actually spend the money on the next generation of antibiotics. There are very few family firms in, in, in Britain, and there's virtually, uh, and, and corporates and mutuals are 
conspicuous by their absence. And you're extremely lucky, guys, that you've got Welsh water, uh, which is doing, uh, doing extremely well here for you in, uh, in Cardiff and South, and South Wales, um, uh, operating, rebating um, you the savings that it makes, actually, unlike Thames water that actually takes those savings and pays them in dividends on which no tax is paid to occur to a consortium of sovereign wealth funds led by a private equity company called Macquarie, an Australian bank in Luxembourg. So you should be, you should be delighted that in Cardiff, at least you get the money rebated. I use Thames Water and my money, my bills find their, ways out, find their way to Luxembourg. Um, it is the rise of the owners corporation. And uh, the market is extremely myopic. I mean, I made this point in the state we're in, that actually the time horizons for um, payback in Britain are about three years, and, the, and people typically want 20% return in over three years. Um, when I came back to this, I'm writing how good we can be, and first of all, the surveys that the DTI and the Bank of England used to do have been cancelled, um, as I was helpfully explained to me by um, uh, uh, um, a recently departed business, department business official. One of the reasons why I abandoned it, Will, was because it gave you such ammunition. Um, I was the only person who was getting interested in it, actually, so that, you know, um, virtually the only person who was getting interested in this subject. And there's something else for you to think about, because um, I think that, that this high cost of capital and the high hurdle rates, the short payback periods, and the high dividend distribution um, probably Im impact more than almost anything else. You know, even tax spending and borrowing decisions by central government, you know, uh, and the amount, of, the amount of time and effort that people spend exploring all this is close to nil. You know, there's a colleague of mine at Oxford called Colin Mayer who does a bit of work on it. But, I mean, when you try to get at this, you'll find that um, social science has virtually nothing to offer someone like me in actually trying to understand this stuff or get under its skin. Um, um, we, so you're watching the eclipse of the public corporation, and the hedge funds have filled the vacuum. Um, and, of course, they're even more short-termists than the pension funds and global asset management companies. And private equity has stepped in, too. And private equity, of course, you know, is more, slightly more long-termist. It takes five-year views and even ten-year views. But actually, all the gain is actually captured, as the Americans we need to talk about, the private equity owners. I mean, this system may be dysfunctional that I've described, <coughs> but at least the dividends get distributed to pension funds and insurance companies and kind of you. Um, this actually just gets captured by a kind of super elite at the top who actually are the people who support private equity. So this becomes the, you know, the retreat from the public markets because the, market, the public markets are dysfunctional has led to a kind of a, a, another driver that Thomas Piketty doesn't really get at in his book Capital but could do, could have done, that actually the retreat from the, the public markets. There, were, there used to be uh, 10,000 shares quoted on the stock market in 1980. There's now less than 3,000 because, you know, Companies themselves are finding it a kind of hopeless way to kind of operate. You can't operate with so much financial pressure on you, deliver returns that are in, in any sense irrational. So you go private. But if you go private, that becomes a mechanism for a kind of a deep, deep, deep driver of wealth inequality. And that gives you some sense of what the ownership structure has been. And uh, you can see that um, the, this is the rest of the world, by the way. Um, and those are global asset management groups like BlackRock. Uh, <coughs> and, you know, Fidelity, they now own 41%. It's close to half, actually, British equity is now owned by um, global asset management groups. Pension funds and insurance companies have really had a mass sell-off of shares. They now together only own 13%. It's near 10, actually. And it was, um, as you can see, close to half of equity in 99. That's because of regulatory changes in which pension funds and insurance companies have to hold more of their cash um, uh, in government bonds and not in equity. That, by the way, has the happy result of meaning that Britain has, um, because of these regulatory changes, because so much of our savings has to be invested in government debt, we have, of any country, um, as the IMF has pointed out, and the OECD back it up, we really don't have a public debt problem at all. Um, because you can flog government bonds in Britain really easily. And the only people to buy it, because we, so most of our public debt in Britain is owned by, by, by pension funds and insurance companies. The average duration of that debt is about 14 to 15 years. You could, you can, I mean, the idea that national debt, 80% of GDP, is, is prevents the difficulty is, is completely, so hysterically funny for anyone who knows the, uh, the truth of the matter. Refinancing that debt every 15 years and, and selling new debt with the funds of GDP is a piece of piss because our pension funds and insurance companies are obliged to bloody buy it. But, the, but the, um, the consequence of that, of course, means that it's really, really easy to run a deficit. 
no need at all for the spending cuts that will be announced next week. That's all bollocks. But the, the, it, has a, it has a counterpart effect on who owns our, the equity of our large corporations, who have become ownerless in the way I've described, super myopic, displacing risk onto ordinary people in, uh, who simultaneously have what little social settlement there is withdrawn from them, for all the reasons you understand. But I, um, this, I mean, I, I think, I, mean, I don't want to be too vain, but I mean, I, how many people you know, understand this machine or talk about it, write about it? Very few. Um, here's the average holding period of shares. I mean, we people shares in a world in which insurance and pension funds <coughs> own most of the equity, eight years, now to less than six months. That's because the hedge funds turn it over and day trading and all of that. Extreme short-termism. Uh, you shouldn't be surprised. I mean, one of the drivers, of course, of this is not just the ownership. It's the way that the owners have organized remuneration patterns so that the people who run our companies are well remunerated for running them kind of in this way. Um, you know, the, you, you, uh, the, uh, it, I, I've done a lot of work on executive pay. It's now rather 150 times kind of um, average pay. It used to be kind of around 35 to 40. It's, it's basically quadrupled since the late 80s. Anyone who thinks that the performance of British companies has quadrupled, uh, you know, lie down in a quiet room. Um, this is the, uh, what's, taking, what's taking place um, under investment. Here we are in 2015. It's kind of worth seven years into the upturn from the base of the, the second quarter of 2008 was the uh, kind of a peak of the, was the um, kind of, that was the trough of the last recession. We now, but you know, business investment is in a tiny fraction of GDP, both historically and where it used to be, and actually compared with others. We're 157th in the international league table. Um, we have a kind of, kind of absolute kind of innovation crisis. Um, and there's a scale-up crisis too. And I, I think it's worthwhile, I sometimes say this, but people, again, I mean, I think a lot, if you look at this in British corporate history, in the late 1930s, kind of, you know, it was, if you take, the, if you take 1929 as being the peak, as being the bottom, and you get to 1936, 1937, kind of seven, eight years out, you know, you could name a dozen British companies that were really doing very well and were going to win us the Second World War. You know, the Hawker Siddeley, Austin, Morris, Thorne, EMI, ICI. Um, you, if, you, uh, if, you think, if you can think of one company that's actually in, that, in a similar place in 2015, you'll have done well. There is Arm that has turnover of 350 million pounds and a market cap of a billion. As the chief executive of Arm says, he is the only one. Uh, it says that we're, our, our financial and ownership architecture is actually inhibiting our startups, and there's many of them, by the way, from scaling up into the great companies of tomorrow. So we are becoming a subcontractor to the rest of the world and a monumental sell off of our assets. I call it in the book um, The Great Cashing Out. Some of you may have seen a film I made for Channel 4 where I stood sort of a kind of windswept tower um, over ICI's Dice Stuff's um, R&D department, which covered about 10 or 11 kind of square acres um, of uh, Manchester, actually. It's now all derelict except for a housing estate there. Uh, but at the time, when I, wrote the, when I wrote the state we're in, I was really worried whether ICI and GEC would actually manage to kind of um, compete with their counterparts in Germany um, Siemens uh, and uh, BASF, and I worried whether they'd be. Uh, I didn't. I never thought, by the way, that what were, that they'd actually get dismembered and wouldn't be and would and not be here anymore. I remember both the Economist and the Sunday Times, David Smith on the Econ on the Sunday Times, and uh, my my new friend Bill Emmert, um, who devoted a whole page in the Economist to Hutonomics, screaming with laughter, and Bruce Anderson doing a review of the State we're in and the Independent. How could it? That it was obvious that actually ICI and GC would be stronger than BASF and, uh, and, and Siemens in 20 years' time, and that Will Hutton was fixated with German ownership structures, but not with their labour market. We had a flexible labour market. They had an inflexible labour market dominated by trade unions. So, of course, uh, when we got to 20 years on, which we have done, um, um, Siemens and BASF would be in trouble. Siemens actually is the biggest engineering company in the world. BASF is the biggest chemical company in the world. Sorry. Siemens is the biggest engineering company in Europe. BSF is the biggest chemical company in the world. ICI is gone. 
uh, and actually, if you're if you you can amuse yourself, actually, there's a there's a cement company and, uh, called I think it's called Heiselberg Cement who took over um, Hudson's cement interests. Um, you can sometimes see them driving around London in Cardiff. Um, it was Hudson stalking ICI that actually led ICI to kind of um, breaking itself up. So that the, the kind of Zeneca bit of um, uh, ICI um, is now AstraZeneca. Um, but look at the stream of companies that have just been, been sold. Um, I regard the banking crisis, like uh, my friends in the Bank of England who agree with me on this subject, actually, was a kind of classic example of, of actually the banks just in questing to grow that, to inflate their balance sheets and remunerate their executive teams. Uh, you know, they're earnless corporations as well, our banking sector. So part of the story of the banking crisis was this, you know, not just a story of deregulation and neoliberalism and all the stuff you're read from the baby leftists who write in the Guardian. It's also, you know, the owners' corporation. I mean, I, I mean, I'm. Uh, <coughs> I learnt yesterday uh, that the Royal Mail, when it's privatised, one of the first things that it did actually when it's privatised, actually. By the way, Royal Mail will in 20 years be owned in exactly the same way as Thames Water. It will be owned by sovereign wealth funds headed by a private equity company in some offshore tax haven, and will be worrying about where a universal postal service. I mean, that's actually obvious. Um, and one of the first things that Royal Mail did, of course, was to was it had it had built an innovative. It built an innovative to, it was a, trying to get innovate, rather like the Bundespost. They had a kind of innovative arm, and it was sh it was privatised um, in September of last year, and they shut it the same month. Um, you know, the EDF Energy um, had a partner, um, Centrica, um, to help it build the new generation of power stations. Centrica said that a ten and a half percent return, guaranteed r real, guaranteed for thirty five years, was actually not adequate for them um, as a utility. They needed higher returns than that. You know. I would love, as I mean, I was speaking to myself, if I could invest my SIP in, to give me 10.5% return in the next 20 years, the rest of my life, I'd be actually, God, blimey, what a wonderful deal. Not good enough for Centrica. They pulled out. The, uh, the Chinese have moved in. And as you all know, the Chinese have made the quid pro quo. By, they're being very difficult, by the way, about um, stumping up their quarter of this uh, uh, 24 billion pound project. But the quid pro quo is that the next generation of power stations will be wholly owned and wholly built to Chinese design shipped out of China. So when actually there's any conflict in the South China Sea, which there will be, the Chinese will turn the lights out if Britain wants to come in on the side of the Japanese and the Americans. Uh, you know, not worrying about this stuff has big, big consequences. It's not just actually the people that are opposite who may be kind of living in those houses and estates in Cardiff and out of Cardiff who've got more risk on their shoulders and living on zero hour contracts and stuff. It's also actually our capacity as a state to do things in the world we might want to do. Um, and I, I, won't, uh, I won't go on. I think that I've tried to, I think you're all aware. This is just what's happened to R&D. Um, you know, because you, once you start gutting your business sector like this, inevitably its capacity to kind of spend money on R&D falls away. We've gone from being top of class to bottom of class. Um, that actually, I mean, I, I mean the, the Bank of England does it again today. Look at your, you'll see that it's uh, ranking alongside um, the risks in Greece. The size of our current account deficit is seen with the Bank of England as our number one financial risk. Uh, it's five and a half cent of GDP and rising because our traded goods sector is, has been eviscerated over the last 20 years. By this process I've just described, coupled with another process, which is that, and I'm, I, I'm, 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 I'm sure I would find if I did a show of hands. Let's actually do a show of hands, actually. Who is in favour of um, floating exchange rates rather than membership of the euro? Who's in favour of floating exchange rates? Two, three. Um, who's in favour of a fixed exchange, a, semi, a fixed adjustable exchange rate system of the type of the, you know, we had uh, by the IMF, you know, we, um, we ran it from the Bretton Woods from broadly the late 1940s to 1971, 72, and it all fell apart. Who's, and we did, we tried to do the same again with the exchange rate mechanism. Who's in favour of that kind of system? One, two, three. <coughs> and who's in favour of some kind of, you know, single currency in Europe? And who doesn't know the answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, floating exchange rates um, have, uh, have actually ripped the guts out of uh, our country. Um, floating exchange rates, I mean, the, the, the pound has been systematically never less than um, 7 or 8% overvalued, even, uh, even after the financial crisis when the pound was subject to a sell-off, and sometimes as much as 20% overvalued, and that's been going on for 30 years. And actually, um, you know, you can see it. Uh, you can see it walking around um, any 
kind of city in our country which actually has depended on the traded goods sector. Uh, you can see it in people's um, wages and living standards, um, but you can also see it in the, tr in the current account numbers. And actually the bank now is saying it's our number one financial risk, which it is. Um, the Office of Budget Responsibility hope, as they, they keep forecasting it, they've done it actually every year for the last since they were established in the autumn of 2010. They always forecast the current account deficit is going to come down, but it keeps going up. Um, I think the current account deficit will be when we start talking about it in the next 10 years in a big, big way. Um, that's where we are. Um, and I think the state we're in, that the answer is some form of stakeholder capitalism. Um, but actually, we have got to um, develop um, a system in which our corporations are owned, whether they're small, medium, or large. Um, I, think we ha I think we have to incorporate, we, you, you need to put purpose, business purpose, right back at the core of uh, capitalism. Um, um, and the, the benefits that flow from that are everything from more innovation to more kind of temperate executive pay. Um, it's also a world, actually, in which there's a recognition of a codependency actually between companies, between companies and finance, and between companies, finance, and public agencies. Um, this, is, this is a world that uh, you know, the business secretary would not recognize at all, but it is, I think, the world in which we are moving. Um, so, I've not got much time. Um, I think uh, that there's a kind of bunch of things that one could do. Um, I set them out uh, in chapter five of uh, my new book, um, How Good We Can Be. I, we, need, we need a Companies Act which actually puts purpose and, and makes that the heart of incorporation and, and redefines the fiduciary obligation of companies as, as, a, as a delivery of purpose. And non-executive directors and shareholders have to you know, buy into that and hold directors' teams account for delivery of purpose. It'll be a bit, it may sound like slightly technical and legalese, have a big, big impact. We absolutely have got to have, a, you know, we need more family firms, we need more mutuals, we need more employee-owned companies, we need, we need to develop what the Germans call the Mittelstand. Um, so we have to, kind of, and, we, and you have to regulate to get that. It won't just happen. Um, we have, to get, we have to follow through on the Vickers reforms and actually develop these challenger banks, really get, uh, and, and really understand that actually banking to uh, a corporate world and a business world in which intangibles are growing at twi are twice the rate of, of, inta of tangibles means that the classic bank manager response, which is take a, <coughs> if you're a startup, a mortgage on your, on your home, or if you're a large company, collateralize the, the kind of bond against the corporate assets is actually no way to proceed. We have to develop a much smarter kind of system of getting our financial or getting our financiers to back intangibles rather than tangibles. And that's a complete transformation in the way it's it comes to everything in the way that um, finance is taught in, in and law is taught in in, in our universities, uh, how we regulate Whole damn thing. I think we need an innovation bank. I was I was very much against the Labour Party's state investment, national investment bank. It sounded to me like uh, the kind of uh, the longest suicide note in history. Michael Foote's '83 Labour Party manifesto it had also called a national investment bank. And what we need is we need a way of actually uh, reassuring bankers that actually that uh, there's some credible value uh, in intellectual property. A copyright and, and patents and all of that stuff, and you, and you, an innovation bank that will simultaneously, <coughs> simultaneously ensure all that and then an, 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 an unleash some of the credit and uh, an angel investment that's required. I mean, I, public benefit corporations, I think that um, I'm, a, I'm an admirer of um, what, what happened at, at uh, Welsh Water. Uh, we, need a, we need to develop a template for that, and I think if the BBC um, gets privatised, which it may very well do, or at least part of the BBC, the bit that makes programmes, it should do it in a public benefit company in which the BBC trust owns a golden share to ensure actually the public service broadcasting is understood to be what as a shareholder, if you're some hedge fund or global asset management group glo buying into the BBC or Channel 4 as it will be when it's privatised, because all this stuff's going to be privatised. I mean, public service broadcasting, as you all know, is one of the casualties of uh, the election. ITV will be sold 
to Liberty Global, John Malone's Liberty Global, before 2020. Channel 4 will be privatised. The BBC will, will be, have its licence fee frozen, further top slicing. It may even be asked on next week, actually, to pay £600 million pounds, um, <coughs> for the people over 75's licence fee. All of that will kill it, and uh, they'll have to, um, Tony Hall and team will have to break it up. And my advice to them is that they're going to, if, as they break it up, to try and break it up um, as a public benefit corporation, and we can then buy, and which they will hold kind of a, a, a golden share, or they will hold the, the, the majority of A and B shares. There's lots of ways you can do this. Uh, but actually, and the Royal Mail should have been sold as a public benefit corporation, and so should Thames Water. Um, and of course, this should have been talked about by the the left. I mean, I'm sure you're all Guardian readers uh, and observer readers, um, but you know the columnists and commentators who are who are baby leftists. I think they uh, never discuss this kind of stuff. It's all kind of uh, anti-austerity, you know, blah, 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 socialize. But actually, you've got to get under the you've got to get under the skin and actually come up with feasible ways in which we can uh, do capitalism for a public purpose in which the mass of people flourish, in which you can win consistent majorities at general elections. Got to get digital sharing, I discussed that. Um, and above all, I think that um, this having some audacious national goals would be fabulous. And I think that you know, Britain could be kind of the place where you know, we could be the number one place in Europe for life sciences, robotics, whatever it might be. Uh, and we should set some audacious goals green revolution, uh, less inequality. A social manifesto, I mean, I, I know that you're doing some work on, on unions and the impact of union density, differential union density in, in, in parts of the community, but I, I would like to see a kind of, we can't, there's no possibility of a revival of, uh, of the liberal left or any kind of modern form of social democracy if we don't have um, growing affiliation to uh, and growing trade unions. And of course, I mean, trade unions are Kind of expensive for ordinary men and women to join, and they're full of people who are actually uh, led by people who don't really understand, I think, what working people actually want from the workplace. Um, I thought the idea of an employee mutual in that in your unions themselves should actually take some of the risk off ordinary people. Um, you know, you should work for the you should work work for the mutual, which hires out hires you out. Um, so that when people in this fast-changing environment inevitably chop and change their workforce, there's a buffer uh, in the mutual between all this risk and actually the lived experience of ordinary people who can now take on mortgages, bring up kids, and all the rest of it. I do think that with the with the I mean, extraordinary kind of um, again, if you believe it, in, like I do, that all these GPTs are going to happen, we have to have ways of allowing people to reskill, reskill, reskill during the course of their lives. Uh, this is just, I mean, I, I, well, I do think that actually um, we should be more kind of, we, 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 should, we shouldn't allow, you know, um, happiness to be kind of Richard Layard's kind of, um, and David Cameron's kind of, uh, you know, shouldn't we be thinking about how, um, you know, our society could be reconfigured with all this, these wonderful things that are happening. Um, to kind of make people less lonely and to offer more happiness. I mean, loneliness is such a scourge. And it would be wonderful if Wales could actually, there's enough, I mean, uh, there's enough, uh, unlike the southeast of England, I mean, there'd be some fantastic kind of pioneering ways of thinking about how to kind of, kind of live in new <coughs> urban communities. Um, I mean, Hugh, I'm told, is actually farming out in Abergavenny, sitting on a tractor. My, I'm sure that, you know, I can't, I, I, just this idea in my mind of how lots of sociologists on tractors and new communities in Abergavenny would be quite stinking. Anyway, um, uh, and I do think the state needs a, needs a, a, a wholesale kind of makeover. Um, you know, I, here again, the, the, the right, the British right have a point. I mean, I feel it myself. You know, you're, the state too often is about stopping you from doing things or doing things to you. Um, and there has been a big effort, and I, I noticed actually in Wales, actually, the Welsh government has really tried to push this agenda along, of being actually a co-creator of value. I'm a big fan of public value being the kind of metric, a shell of value has been the dominant metric in the last 30 years for companies. Let's put public value creation as the metric for what officials and people and public agencies should be thinking about. And I'm very, very, I'm very, very... Um, I, I, kind of, I detest this, I'm sure you all agree, but 
I do detest this kind of this bookkeeping framework in which we do our public endeavour in Britain. You know, the idea is that in 2018-19, public debt should be falling dramatically from 80% of GDP, as if that was a magical number, around public expenditure, 35.5% of GDP, uh, or taxes, 35.5% of GDP, because actually you put a, you're never going to increase tax rates. All the tax can do is stay the same or go down. So that gives you... You know, you know your economy is going to grow by a couple of percent per annum, and you know there'll be a couple of percent inflation, so you know that nominal GDP will be whatever it's going to be, 20% higher in, in, in four years' time. That means your tax revenues, if you don't increase the tax rates, will be 20% higher, which means if, the, if your target is to, is to have debt that's falling, means public expenditure has to be on this trajectory, it becomes the residual. Um, and then because you, because you may promise the National Health Service and pensions, which are triple locking, um, there's double residual for things like um, what you can spend in cities, what you can spend on the environment, what you can spend on education, what you can spend on further education, uh, what you can spend on the infrastructure becomes a residual, um, not something which actually has any public value intrinsically. It's just something that um, is kind of an afterthought after those big book, book, those big bookkeeping objectives have been met. And I like the idea of the state as a kind of master insurer in chief, kind of insurer. You know, it's actually towards innovation where it collectivizes and socializes risk, but also ensure in chief in the sense that actually it is the trigger and catalyst for all the agencies that will help people manage the risk in their lives, you know, ill health, aging, unemployment, whatever it might be. Um, and I'm kind of trying to think of ways to actually escape the sense that the kind of state is the coercer, uh, the inhibitor of liberty. Uh, I want to find a language in which you can have reinvent it as a um, kind of, as nice one, as an insurance chief. So, if we could do that, I think it would produce, and I'm very keen on this notion of mass flourishing. Um, I, think, you know, I think, you know, all this is within our grasp. All this could be what we're doing now rather than what is happening to us. Um, and I think Wales, you know, could, um, you know, it's not, you haven't got you know, a lot of that stuff that I put up there, I mean, corporate governance is going to, will remain Whitehall and Westminster. But actually, you know, there's quite a lot of ways in which uh, the Welsh government could actually start to create some innovative hotspots <coughs> with lots of scale-ups. It could certainly think through um, uh, how it was going to approach um, uh, some digital platforms. Uh, it could also embrace the smart agenda and push that, which it is doing to a degree, in fairness. Um, it could, also, it could also rethink how the um, French public agencies interact with, with a Welsh civil society. Um, and it could get some of the way towards having a bit more mass flourishing for Welsh citizens than is, than is happening in England. And my last slide is that, you know, here's some of the things that actually could be happening at Wizard. Um, I think that, you know, the, one or two of you may have got interested in the idea of GPTs. If you think this intangible agenda is interesting, would it be nice to know more about it? Um, I'd love to be more work on ownership. And, and it's, uh, um, do firms, I mean, let's reconceptualize the firm. Um, if there is a Welsh innovation ecosystem, I'm not sure what it is, and it would be very good to have it mapped. Um, if you think I'm right that we, we should get trade union movement, uh, revive the trade union movement, one of its places it got born was here in the 1870s and 1880s, couldn't we kind of rethink what would make, um, uh, and how would you, how could you have, how could you develop a trade union that would only cost, um, I mean, if you want to be a member of Unison, you know, it costs between 12, 20 pound a, a month. It's a big, a lot of money for a kind of, um, so, you know, really trade union membership should cost, should cost, you know, two to five pounds a month, or a pound a week. Um, and then, you know, once you start thinking about, well, how do you do, that, and, and then what kind of, you know, make it, what kinds of things do we want out of their workplace? Actually, they want to, most people want to be partners in enterprises that are growing, actually, where they feel they've got some voice. Um, I wonder about mapping new forms of social, for more, new forms of social association. Would be kind of, I know you're doing some of that, actually. And uh, there's a wonderful new book out in the States that's doing very, very well. I haven't realized, but the Americans are starting talking about you know, that the number of officials in the federal government is actually um, less than it was in 1960. Uh, even though they're handling kind of four times the expenditure. And actually, I think, I mean, I would love to kind of, um, kind of take on this, this um, 
notion that the only the only future for government is a world in which uh, a, kind of a few officials contract out to companies like Capita and Circo. Um, uh, and I think, by the way, this kind of mercenary kind of contracting out culture is going to come to an end. But when it comes to an end, it, it, needs, it will need an intellectual underpinning for what succeed for what that will succeed it will actually deliver in terms of efficiency and welfare. So there's, I think, a big, big agenda. To, I know that talking to you were kind of some of the stuff is what you're already doing. But I uh, was thinking that, you know, if I was, if I was living in Cardiff, you know, I, some of the stuff I'd be trying to get going and I'd be trying to get um, the Welsh Government to pick up with some of the stuff and run with it. Um, and speaking as uh, kind of an Englishman living in London, it'd be wonderful if uh, you could then point to things working in Wales that actually could be copied uh, rather than that kind of disastrous narrative about what happened in the NHS was the lesson to uh, what might happen to England if the Labour government got their control of you know, the NHS. That was not helpful. But look, thank you very, very much. I think the, uh, you know, just to finish off, I, I think the, you know, the answer to the exam question, the exam question is, I think, you know, how does one create a, an economy and society in which the mass of people flourish? I'm absolutely, you know, it would be no surprise to any of you that I think that the answer that's provided uh, by the Conservatives, by this Conservative government that has a tiny majority in the House of Commons is very largely wrong. It's not, you know, there's bits of it, obviously, that, you know, not, en not, not everything that a pilot like that does is completely wrong, but most of it is. And I do think there's another agenda to be picked up. I think it corresponds to the values um, of most people who live in our islands. And it's long overdue that we had a kind of, we won the intellectual argument and had politicians uh, and cultural leaders, actually, and public intellectuals who could confidently make these kinds of arguments. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.